Um, Barry yesterday um, mentioned sort of in passing that not everybody would be willing to buy one of these two cable models that he had. And um, but he didn't really tell you a lot of detail about um, people who, will, who, who wouldn't. And um, so I want to talk about how I think about related topics. I don't think I fit into either of those camps that Barry was talking about. I find myself agreeing with some things that Barry and David says, agreeing with some things that Tim says, but there's also things that are either points of disagreement or are symptoms of us just starting from different places and asking different questions, and maybe that'll become clear. Um, things, yeah. um, I often, one of the things I like about talking to these people is they often come from very different starting points than I do, and I find that very um, interesting and use, useful. Okay, so, and um, a number of years ago, um, I tried to write a paper explaining how I think about these things, and the record re-reports made it clear that there's just no way I could say everything I want to say in one paper, and so I wrote a book. And the book is called Beyond Chance of Credence. It's going to be published by Oxford University Press. And one of the things that I have to do when I go back home is clean it up and um, send Peter Macho off the final version. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll put up a um, URL linking to a shared Dropbox folder where you can find a um, PDF of the current draft. OK, so something that's already been mentioned um, is that the word probability isn't inevitable. From early days, the world pro probability was used in at least two um, senses. This is well documented in um, Ian Hacking's book, The Emergence of Probability. Uh, so I want to um, distinguish two senses, or maybe two broad classes of senses. One is an epistemic sense which has to do with the limitations of knowledge and reason belief. Um, sometimes we'll model an ideal agent with no cognitive limitations as um, having numerical degrees of belief. There are no such things. Um, but I think if, my own view is that that apparatus can be useful for certain cases. So in certain cases, it can be useful to pretend you have numerical degrees of belief in certain things. In other cases, you, you want to classify those things and maybe try to represent your belief state by a set of credences, or um, uh, um, you know, uh, um, these are tools to be used for certain purposes, not, not a literal representation of anything going on in your head. Can, can I clarify what's yeah. the difference between credence and belief? Um, credence is degree of belief. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so here's the intuitive idea. There are some things we're pretty darn sure of. The sun is shining, right? Other things we um, are pretty sure are false, and other things we, we think, okay, it's more likely than, than not that it's true, but we're less certain, stuff like that. So the idea is to take those gradations of uh, strength of belief and model them by actual numerical degree, degrees of belief. Okay. And then there are arguments that they ought to, if you, a being that had such a thing, um, those ought to satisfy the problem, the calculus of probabilities. Okay. Then there's another sense, um, which Hawking calls hacking, sorry, the aleatory thing. Has, the, the, where a probability is meant to be a characteristic of um, physical circumstances leading up to an event, like a, a um, roll of a die or um, toss, toss of a coin. Obviously, a characteristic of the die or the coin itself, but not just the die or the coin itself, because it depends on the process by which it's rolled. Um, and um, following some of the standard um, literature and probability, I call those chances. I like, I prefer not to, to use the word probability except when I, I want to be neutral between the, 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 those two. Yeah. Can I just add? Yeah. It, suppose I believe the fundamental, fundamental dynamics of the world is a stochastic process. Yes. That it doesn't, 
you, you think that goes on the aleatory side? Yeah. But I mean, the difference being, if I believe that, then I really do think there's a real number. Yes. And, and this is consistent with there not being a real number. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, good. See, you know, you're anticipating something like that I want to say. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah, so if I have a stoch if, if there's a fundamental theory and it's a stochastic theory, then those things are going to be built into the theory. Right? That's going to be the job. Right. Right. Um, right. And um, then the question is, whether there's something for the place, something like that kind of role, even in the deterministic theory. Right. Yeah, so, um, and I want to say this, okay, it can be a mistake to think of these, sometimes you see in the literature, it um, talks as if there are rival interpretations of probability and have to pick one of these as the meaning of probability. I think that's a major mistake. Um, now, interesting question is, okay, I think, and some people may disagree, but I, I think that um, a live option and a coherent option is for the, the laws of physics just to be fundamentally stochastic, in which case those chances are built into the laws of physics. On the other hand, for most of the develop, time when probability theory is being developed, um, most of the people who are talking about it presume that the laws of physics are deterministic. And um, if you read some of these people, they, um, they sort of like, everybody knows that the laws of physics are deterministic. And usually there's an, often there's an appeal to God. Okay. Uh, or a principle of sufficient reason. You know, if we had indeterminism in the world, there'd be no reason for something to happen one way or another. This was actually regarded by some of these guys as an a priori truth, right? Um, so um, they so they, they write these books on probability and say, well, there's no such thing as probability in the world. Probability is entirely epistemic. And you'll say, you'll, you'll, you'll find statements to that, um, the case. But you'll also find these people saying things like that. So, yeah, right, 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 I'm sorry. So here's more. In themselves and objectively, all things under the sun which are, were, or will be always have the highest certainty. Seen in relation to us, the certainty of things is not the same for all things, but vary in many ways, increasing and decreasing. Probability is degree of certainty. And you'll see something very similar in Laplace and uh, in other people. Okay, here's what we're doing again when you talk about games of chance. The originator of these games, the games took pay, play pains to make them equitable by arranging that the numbers of cases that result in profit and loss be definite and known that all, and that all the cases happen equally easily. The originator is probably did exactly the opposite. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the interesting thing that Hacking mentions in this book is that people have been gambling with various things for a long time. And the, um, the Latin word for um, die comes from is it, what, if ox ankle bone or something like that. And people were gambling on those, the, the, those things, and those aren't fair die. Right. Anyhow, so, um, right, so, the, okay, so this is what the word Bernoulli says. Um, right, and so that's not that it's a matter of fact whether, you know, if you've got a game of chance, whether or not it's, you know, there's an equal chance for each guy to come up place. And Laplace, you know, um, but they fix that by the trick you chose in the other day, right? You get to choose which side you went on. And you may do that right. Well, 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 okay, okay, well, yeah. Um, right. That's it. But anyways, so the Bernie Adams people, they, they, they espouse an official doctrine of, um, um, of probability, which is, makes it wholly developed, whole, wholly um, epistemic, and then they slip in, uh, into, into talking about th things as if there's a really matter of fact about the probability of heads on the die or something um, 
uh, um, um, like that, and, it's, and you can say, okay, it, it's not just a mistake, but um, it does seem like if you have someone who is worried about whether a game is rigged, we can actually test whether the, the die is fair by doing, you know, throwing the dice a lot of times and doing statistical analysis. It, and it does not seem to be that I am presupposing fundamentally indeterministic physics in this. So I want to make sense of that kind of thing. So, in, um, yeah, the question of whether um, the world is ultimately deterministic or, or stochastic is a deep metaphysical question. It is not settled by the empirical success of quantum mechanics, in spite of what some people say. And it seems that I ought to be able to make sense of these kinds of procedures without thinking, without worrying about that. So there does seem to be a need for a concept of chance on which there's a matter of fact about the chance of getting a six of die, and about claims about these chances can be tested in empirically. Um, and some, something that's compatible with deterministic physics. And I think the tension is, is um, remains if you open up a textbook of statistical mechanics, and this is, this is my sort of entry in the whole thing, is think, trying to make sense of this. Early on, though, the, when they're telling you what's the, so in an in, intro textbook, right? So the intro textbooks have a little paragraph about what the subject matter is. And they'll tell you that um, um, statistical mechanics deals with systems of a large number of degrees of freedom. They're big and complicated. We'll never know the precise state of the system. And even if we could, we wouldn't be able to keep track of it. We'd have some ignorance about the macro state of the system. And for that reason, we're introducing probability distributions. And then they often stipulate particular probability distributions for various equilibrium states. So if you've got this isolated system of a known energy, it's a microcanonical. If you've got a system in contact with heat at a certain temperature, it's a canonical. And then um, there, may, there may be some kind of plausibility arguments. It's not uncommon for these textbooks to say, ultimately, the choice of, of these is you make predictions on the basis of them, and they're justified by experiment. Now, I'm fairly certain whatever you're doing, if you prepare a system in a, in a um, certain state, and you do experiments on it, whatever you're doing is you're not trying to find out over your own state of mind. Right? And they seem to be employing both epistemic and objective conceptions in an inconsistent manner. What I, what, I, what, I, what I would claim is actually there's a way to make this sounds crazy, but there's a way to make sense of all this. Um, I said a moment ago that um, we want a notion of chance on which descriptions of, uh, of chance to events are, are, um, are testable. Typically, the way you do that is you uh, have repetitions of things you, you can as pretty much the same chance. <coughs> they have the same, you know, roll the dice a bunch of times, and you assume that the die doesn't change too much in between, and so the chance of, of a six or it's the same each time. And you do a statistical analysis. And I just want to have everyone clear in their minds the picture I have of how that works. This, you know, this is a, or anything. So, the, so coin toss, most of the coin that you might not be uncertain of whether it's a fair coin or not. You know, you might, you know, Tim might have pulled it out of his pocket and you knew we were going to be talking about probability and knowing Tim, you're a little worried that he might have gone and gotten a, a, a biased coin. Right, so you might think, okay, maybe this coin is a fair coin, maybe it's weighted towards heads, maybe it's weighted for tails. We want to test it. So what I'm going to do is just assume or pretend um, you start with some credences about the bias. And, the, and um, very often when you're 
doing the examples, you discretize it and, and imagine a finite number of hypotheses. Of course, that bias could take um, any value. So what you're really going to have is, you know, if I take intervals, of, you know, if I take the interval between 0 and 1, the chance of heads could be anywhere in there, and I'm going to ascribe credences to it being in, you know, certain various intervals, stuff like that. Okay. And I'm going to assume that I can be generated by a credence density function. So you want to know your credence that the, the, the chance of heads is in a certain set, and just if you hold that density function. Okay. All right, so what do you do? You, you flip a coin a number of times, you get some result, and that, and that result will be a certain number of heads and a certain number of tails. When I originally prepared this slide, the first time I used it, I actually did flip a coin, and this is what I got. I got seven, flipped it ten times, I got seven tails and three heads. And so what you can do is, now we want, we want to do this in the days in the framework, we update our beliefs about the, 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 the um, chance of heads by conditionalizing on this result. Okay. Good. Base there. Okay, so we're going to need that. Conditional on assumption that, that lambda is in, in, in a certain interval, what's our credence that, um, of, getting, of, of getting this result? Okay. Just, just quickly, do you have a favorite way of getting from here's what I would like credences to be, therefore I can use base theorem? Say that again. Do you have a favorite way of getting from, here's what I would like my credences to be, therefore I can use probability calculus on them? Say a little more about what I would like my credences oh. to be. Oh, so, so Cox's theorem presents a okay. certain desiderata for credences. Right. That's nice. Magic yeah. happens out of the probability theories. Um, Is that sort of approach what you have in mind in the background? Pick, yeah, yeah, pick your favorite. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so the arguments that they ought to, uh, you know, ought to, ought to, to satisfy um, the, the axis of probability, um, James Joyce has a, um, a um, argument from, um, from, from accuracy or probabilism. For my purposes, take your yes, okay. right, right. Take your favor. Take your favor. If you have one. Okay. All right, okay, um, yeah. And here's where the principal principle is, um, comes in. So, um, all right, so what I can do is, um, for any x, I can, I can say if the chance of heads, if they're independent tosses and the chance of heads on each toss is x, I, I, I can ascribe a um, chance to that outcome that I got. So. For the outcome I had, um, I had three heads and seven tails, so it would be you know, x cubed times one minus x to the, to, to the, to the seven. And the way that gets turned into um, something I plug into to, to um, um, Bayes' theory of views, and up in day is say, well, Conditional on the hypothesis that the chance of um, on, on a given hypothesis, chance hypothesis, which will ascribe a certain chance to that outcome, conditional on that assumption, my credence, it, it, conditional credence in that outcome is the chance that the hypothesis gives to that outcome. Um, very often, people will when they're informally presenting um, uh, 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 the principle, the principle um, they'll the, the explain to people as, when you know the chances, you set the credence equal to the chances. And um, I prefer that people don't do that because in my view, most interesting, where the principle, principle really does a lot of work is when you don't know the chance and you're, and you're, and you're testing it testing uh, hypotheses about the chance and, you, and, and it's what you need to turn the evidence into something you can use, the data into evidence about chances. 
Okay, consequences of that, if you work it out, um, is that um, unsurprisingly, um, the likelihood function, which you know, uh, uh, ends up be playing a, um, an important role. And the, uh, if your credences satisfy the principal principle, what happens to your credence about chance is you take your initial density function, multiply it by the likelihood, and normalize. Now, why this is useful is that this thing is peaked at the observed relative frequency. If n is, um, is um, 3 and n is 7, that, that has its peak at 3 sevenths. And it can, becomes more and more sharply peaked at the observed relative frequency as you do more and more things. So um, in the case where you can uh, um, tosses, if I get three heads and seven, seven tails, that's what that um, likelihood function looks like. If I do a thousand tosses and get 300 heads and 700 tails, that's what it looks like. Okay. All right. So what you do is you just conditionalize on. Um, is that a combinatorial factor? Nope. No, and here's why. Okay, okay. I, I, I should add this. Right. So if um, I use a sufficient, so <clears throat> this thing depends only on, on, on M and N and, and not the order, right? So a sufficient st statistic would be just to tell you the M and N. And so instead of giving you the evidence, instead of just giving you the result, I could tell you um, just that sufficient statistic, how many heads and how many tails. And if I tell you that, then what you have learned is that the result was one of the ones that, 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 that had um, that many heads and that many tails. And the probability of that happening has that combinatorial factor in front of it. But I didn't do that. I said, E is not the statement, so in, in this case, E is not the statement that we got three heads and tails, E is the statement that this is the result. Thanks for that question. So, good. Um, yeah, so if I update on this, um, if I update on this um, information, what does that do with my credences? Well, I only tossed it 10 times. If initially your credences about the, the, um, the bias were flat, then you might start to suspect, OK, that's some evidence, but not really strong evidence in favor of it being tails biased. If you were fairly certain it was a fair coin, then that's not going to change your cream. You know, three, three, ten tosses, three, three, three heads, seven tails. That's not going to budge those credences very much. So you can just do the calculation. If I um, do it ten times and, and get three out of um, ten, if I start with flat credences, it, you know, it just becomes the normalized likelihood function. If I start with something like this, I'm fairly certain that the bias is close to one half. Um, that's an actual calculation. I didn't just copy the same graph twice, <laughs> but <laughs> um, they're visually the same tool. It doesn't look much enough. So qualitatively, that's the sort of thing that you would expect. Okay. So the key, the, the key technical message is that if I have an analog, if I have either chances and my credences satisfy the principles principle, or I have an analog of chances you know, with respect to them, my credences satisfy the conditional the principal principle, I can do ordinary statistical testing about how to hypothesis both chances. And with me so far? Okay. Alright, so as said there's tension, this determinative can make nonsense of the idea that the matter of fact of, about these sorts of things, claims about which are subject to the empirical test. And in response to this kind of question, 
during the 19th century, two kinds of um, and, but, um, conceptions developed that I believe don't work, and I'm not going to. If I started to give the argument that they don't work, we would do nothing else the rest of the day. So there's a chapter in the book about these things. So let me just say, and defer a discussion of it, that the idea that objective probabilities are um, it, it can be defined with, by, by um, reference to your counting of poss possibilities doesn't work. Um, because as the class already pointed out, it requires its input of which possibilities are equally possible. By the way, um, the other day I had a brain fart and um, I ascribed that um, strange claim about the, the game of chances to Diderot. It was actually down there. So, uh, in Diderot's grave. Too. And that actually makes it more interesting because Dalbert, if you know his name, you know him as a mathematician. Right. So, um, and what one thing that is prevalent these days, especially among physicists, that, that, that objective probabilities are just relative for frequencies. And um, we, that came up um, in talking about um, Kelly Goldstein to you because he, he, he um, rejects um, but, um, certain notions of probability on the, on the assumption that they would re require, that they would be applicable to single case things. So, um, all right. So, why is it like this? So, I think there's an important loop to my broken notion of pro probability that makes sense. I mean, the loop to Louisiana idea is similar to the second, but it's not the same thing. What's that? Yes. All right. And so, I'm not sure what argument you'd give that the, those with the dead ends. But it'd be interesting if you had an argument that would show the police idea. The which idea? The Lewis's idea. Okay. If um, your argument is against frequencies, shows it. Um, I'm not sufficiently familiar to the Lewisian idea to, to com com comment on that. So, um, so ask, ask me again in a few months. Okay. Uh, Makes it, and reflects imperfect knowledge of crisis aid and that that was just generates test and periods predictions. That's what I want, that's what my goal is to get that. And I think that, that if you look at these these people, these writers in the uh, 18th and 19th century on probability, one thing they, they talk about some things occurring more easily than others. So that quote from Bernoulli, um, the Orkey said the originator of game of chance made sure made sure that all the thought, all, all the guys occurred equally easily, and I think that there's something right about that. And um, you know, for example, if I have a pencil, it's not as easy to balance it on this point as it is to lay it down um, flat. And that has to do in part with the physics of this of, of the system, but also in part on with, with the sort of control you have all, 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 all over it. So I want to illustrate the, the picture I have by means of a simple example. Um, and so I chose this perfect simple example because it's easy to state and it's also mathematically well studied and you can prove theorems about it. So here, here's a gadget I call a parabola gadget. It's a board, one meter square, on which is described a parabola and a diagonal. The parabola touches the two bottom corners and it touches the top in the middle. And there's a ball. This starts out somewhere on the diagonal. And here's, it's got a switch, you can turn it on. And once you turn it on, here's what it does. If it's on, it starts out on the diagonal and it moves vertically till it hits the parabola. So if it's below the parabola, it goes up. If it's above the parabola, it goes down. Once on the parabola, it moves horizontally till it hits the diagonal. So if it has to go to the right to hit the diagonal, it does that. If it has to go to the left, it does that. And then it's back on the diagonal. And it just repeats. I'm going to end it. Right. Now I have one of these. I brought it with me. 
Um, it was in my suitcase, and, um, and um, this morning before I came to breakfast, I just set the thing running. So it's run, at this point, hundreds of, of, of iterations. And when it's turned off, the ball just moves freely on the diagonal. And I didn't do anything to do it before turning around. So it was in my suitcase, so it's been on three planes and a ferry. And the ball was just wherever it ended up. Okay. Play a game. <laughs> so I've got Broadway Gadget that's been running for a while. I say at least 10 or iterations, but actually hundreds. Which do you regard as more probable? At this moment right now, that the ball is within 10 centimeters of the right side, or the ball is with in this 20 centimeter band centered on the ground. Any thoughts on that? And I said, no particular care has been setting in the initial. Okay.
the, um, the parabola gadget, that if B is more likely than A on some iteration, is it possible for the same to be true on the very next iteration? Because if you take everything in B, on the very next iteration, they all end up in A. It's not a state, it's, it's not an equivariant or invariant probability assumption. Okay. Okay. And Alice says, well, look, if you think of the x values that map, map into um, um, uh, um, that, re that, 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 that region A, um, its width is greater than. Um, um, yeah. Right. And then, yeah, he says initial probabilities will tend to go with the ones that get more weight to the extreme. This isn't a calculation, but it's sort of like the back of the hand way that it seems like A will be more likely. But, you know, think about um, what the calculation might do. So one thing you might do is do a Monte Carlo simulation, take a whole bunch of initial um, 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 Conditions. Another thing you do, you might do, is actually put a prob the initial probability distribution on the diagonal and see what the dynamics does to it. And in general, this has been talked about before. If I have some physical system in the dynamical ma map that takes states at some some time t zero to the state and up to another time, that dynamics will induce an evolution on probability distribution. By probability distribution at, 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 at time, at state of time zero, that map, into, you know, and I want to, 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 to say what, what does it say about states at time one? I look at a s set of states at time one and say, well, what's the set of states to get mapped into that set? And, and then what's the, the, the probability at time zero of that set of states? Is everyone familiar with this? Yeah. This is not new to people here, good. All right. You're carrying out the probability with the, with the evolution. What's that? You're carrying the probability with the, the evolution. Yeah. Right. OK, so an interesting fact about the parabola of gadget is that there's a tendency for different probability distributions and initial condition to learn look, to, to yield fairly, like, virtually the same distributions, even just a few iterations. So um, you can do the cal so what this calculation I just talk talked about starting out with the initial probability density and just evolve it a few steps in the future is easy to provide. I was, I was using Maple because my um, university has a site license for Maple and I don't have to use it, so it's not hard to do. And so, so I take a flat distribution and evolve it just five iterations. It Wait, this is flat in what parameter? Length on the diagram. Length on the diagram. Yeah, so these are, yeah, so these, I'm sorry, these are all probability densities with respect to length, length on the diagonal. Okay. Right. Yeah, so if I take it as flat with respect to length on the diagonal, the, the, we evolve that probability density, this is what it goes to. If I evolve something that's quite a bit different, then after only five, you know, it, 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 it iterations goes to that. And this is the density for a um, for a um, probability distribution that is not only invariant under the dynamics, but has this sort of attractor status that other things uh, um, head head towards it. It's not the unique um, um, invariant distribution because a delta function co concentrated just on that point where the diagonal cr cr crosses a parabola is also one. Um, but that one's on the uh, But if you just perturb it a little bit, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, right. You'll just Wait, I, I just want to make sure I understand the graphs. So it looks like the probability is piling up on both ends of the yeah. diagonal. Yes. But the left end of the diagonal, the, the way it's going, it, it's going, it looks like it's going in towards the right side of the diagonal. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, OK, yeah. So it's the, yeah, right. Yeah, so. If I start in the middle, yeah. it goes towards the right side of the diagonal, boom, and then it goes down here, and it goes towards the left yeah. side. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. right here. Right. Good. Yeah. Good. So, 
So, but I'm glad you mentioned that because um, the um, that probability distribution is symmetric under a reflection um, in the middle. The actual gadget itself is not. Right. Right. So um, we have a symmetry in the, the invariant distribution that's not actually present in the dynamics. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So this has a status of an attractor measure. Um, lots and lots of um, um, measures over initial conditions will, after only a few iterations, yield pretty much the same, the same probability conditions later. Um, it is an invariant um, um, measure. It's, um, and in that sense, it's picked up by the dynamics. So we're talking about um, Sorry, it becomes stationary. At uh, uh, this point, but the, the medium iterations remains the same. Okay, so things are pro so if I start oh, it keeps the attractor yeah. is stationary. The attractor the, the never get to the attractor. It's a, it's a it's a stationary measure, right? So if you start out with that measure, it it's invariant under the the, the in the, the evolution. And if you start out with something else, it asymptotically It asymptotically right. approaches right. it. It never actually reaches it. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, so Yeah, it's all time reversal. Um, so, so the dynamics I gave is actually not time reversal. No, it's not. I see. I know. Right. I that. But that, but that actually um, isn't the main point because actually there's a fact about the gadget that I didn't mention. There's another variable that keeps at any direction keeps track of whether the thing was on the left or the right in the previous thing. So the dynamics over the full state space is actually invertible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the dynamics over this variable is so invertibility is not the what, what makes this possible. Right. right. Okay, that, yes. No, you can see in principle it could be completely reversible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So yeah. So if I start out with something, so I start out with, 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 with this invariant measured states. Let's say, if I start out with something that's different, it asymptotically approaches this invariant measure, never totally reaches it. So, um, but, yeah. So again, I didn't um, just copy the, the, the same picture twice. I actually did the calculation and graphed the result both times. Um, after five iterations, um, the differences are, 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 you know, Within that. Yeah, with, within the resolution of this screen, the, 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 the differences are not existent. You wouldn't be able to tell the, visually the difference between the two graphs. So, um, so after ten iterations, it's a little bit different, but it always gets. Uh, right. So after five iter iterations, I get this. If I were to do it five more, then they, they, it would be a little different from what it. it right. <coughs> Um, but at that point, you know, to tell the difference, I would have to up the machine precision on, on all of my calculations. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, asking what, you know, things, asking how we approach this distribution, but, you know, yeah, at a certain point, no matter how much you care, care about, if you put a band on how much you care about differences, you know, eventually it's going to get below that big battle. Okay. 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 So there's a sense in which the dynamics of a, of, 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 of a system can pick out some kind of special measure. Um, it's, um, and on that measure, um, those two options get that Alice Fogg, the ratio is about eight to eight fifths. You can do the, the, the calculation. Okay. Now, if you'd like, you never, so you ask, these are the distributions or distributions with respect to which variable, um, then um, the answer is linked on the diagonal. <coughs> if you like, you can, if you, if you like uniform distributions with flat density, you can make a change of variables um, um, that, um, such that this distribution is uniform in that variable. 
there it is. So um, this x is linked along the diagonal. This u is that other variable u. And um, the um, attractive distribution doesn't give equal probability to equal intervals of x, but it does give you um, 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 uh, uh, um, equal probability to equal intervals of u. And if you actually want proof theorems about the thing, the natural thing to do is make that change of variables, and then the mapping it becomes the tent map in that tent. That change, those variables are just piecewise linear, which simplifies some things. Uh, I don't understand the difference. So uh, uh, x equals 0 is the left side? Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and x equals 1 is the is right, side. right side. Yeah. So. And so u equals 0 is the left side, and u equals 1 is the right side, but equal intervals of x in between don't correspond to equal intervals of u, always. But this corresponds to that symmetrical curve? So this is just another way to measure where you are on the diagonal. I can say, well, look, where are you on the diagonal? I'm at 40 centimeters. On this variable, that's this. That's how far you are. In terms of u, that's how far you are from the left side. It's just a change of variable. Do you, do you get the idea? No, that's not Okay. So I, I can take. So if I tell you the value of u is 0.4, you can tell me how far you are from the left. I tell you the value of u is 0.8, then that's how far you are from the left in meters. And u represents that. It's another way of measuring distance along the diagonal, other than the. Oh. Okay. You rip around the price. And let's reparameterize the diagonal. That's all it is. It's a change of variable. And the only reason for doing that is that the map from one iteration to the to the other is well. First of all, a reason for for doing that reparameterization is with respect to that variable, the attractor measure has a flat density. So this is a change of variable, but instead of using x, you are using u. That's so, exactly right. Yes, and now you will, in, in the next step, you will use u instead of x, and some things will appear wrong. Okay. In, in this variable, the, the, the distribution is flat. The problem that, okay. is flat. Yeah. Okay, it would not be... It would not be a particularly good idea to switch which variable you're using from one iteration to the next. So, um, what I'm saying is, is a useful thing to do is to um, reparameterize and say, and, and on each iteration, use u as the variable that you're using to indicate the position of the ball. Right. And the reason for that, the, the reason that that's um, useful is that if you now rewrite the dynamics in terms of u, u it's a tent now. It's piecewise linear. You got that idea? It's just, it, but it's just purely a matter of convenience. It's easier to work with. So if you like uniform distributions, here's a variable with respect to which that attractor distribution is uniform. You don't have to use that if you don't like it. I got that idea? Okay. Okay. So now, if I, it is true of this thing that um, if I take any um, probability distribution over initial conditions that can be represented by a, a a density function with respect to length on the diagonal, if I run it long enough it'll approach that attractor distribution as much as you want. But, for, but, for, but if I ask you to bet at any finite time, um, then it is not true that arbitrary distributions, even arbitrary distributions that have a density with respect to the length on the diagonal, are going to be end up close. So for example, there are probability distributions that after, may be more probable than A after 10 iterations. 
It's characteristic of those that they vary very rapidly over the space of initial conditions. Um, and so, for example, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to five because I want to actually graph the thing. And suppose that Bob thinks after five iterations, equal intervals of the diagonal are equal probable. What does he have to, what kind of beliefs about initial conditions would lead to that? Here's one. Right. So, there's a reason why I told the story about this thing moving freely on the, on the, di on the diagonal um, and being you know, subject to the tender mercies of Air Canada vacuum handlers and then put on a ferry. Um, so if Bob is telling you that um, he thinks after five iterations he will be probable, and you say, well, what does he have to believe about Air Canada vacuum handlers and the waves of, 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 of the Adriatic Sea? Is that after all that handling, this kind of this is a prop, this is a probability distribution for where everything ends up, and um, I think that um, the right thing to say is Bob, you're nuts, um, and I think the right the reason that the right thing to say is Bob, you're nuts is we we all have some you know, given those kind of conditions. Even if I don't have a principle that um, uniquely specifies credences, uh, we do have some kind of judgment about which, uh, perhaps vague, about what sorts of credences might be reasonable and might, might not be. And this is just nuts. Right. Another game, 1,000 parabola gadgets have been running for a while. At least 10 iterations, which you regard as more probable. A. We don't, you know, look at these stats and say, well, how many of them have their balls in region A? How many of them have their balls in region B? You know, which one is more probable? Yeah. I'm um, just saying, I'm not sure if you'll agree, but um, this very nice example has a natural translation into the language of typicality that you can say that the stationary distribution of the five iterations or ten iterations is the typical. Uh, distribution of a sufficiently large number of. Okay. Uh, good, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I want to start a comparison between this. Um, yeah, so what I'm saying sounds an awful lot like what people were saying yesterday about the physicality. Not exactly, but it is. It, 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 an awful system. lot. An awful lot, right. Um, and. Um, in particular, um, Tim was saying, well, we don't have a precise definition of what a good typicality measure is, but we know certain kind of features and stuff like that. And that's all we need to have get to get this going, is a kind of vague notion about it. Okay. Now, one thing that I'm concerned about, is, and Tim disavowed, is um, on this notion, if it's a notion of what, if, Instead of using the word typicality, you take these probability distributions over initial conditions up as your judgment of the sorts of things a reasonable agent could have. Then it certainly is a guide to your expectations. Right? I you know, suppose you know I ought to be able to say to Bob, you should expect more, you know, you should expect more of them have, have, have their balls in region A than region B. Because in order to regard this as more likely or that, you would have to regard as reasonable credences over the um, in, in initial conditions that vary absurdly quickly over that diagonal. And you don't regard those as reasonable. You don't have that kind of deep, none of us have that kind of detailed knowledge of the, of the thing. And so in this case, so if someone says, I, I don't, yeah, so as I said, I, I agree with a lot of what other people say, and this notion of is playing a role not unlike the role that typicality involves, 
But one, one thing I, I am concerned of is because I want to tie this in with hypothesis testing, I wanted to actually have some light in terms of what you should expect. So, so it's stability against small perturbations part of the criteria to be Yeah, it, yeah, that? yeah, so, yeah, so, um, you know, so one thing I was invoking, so when, when Luke does his, his Monte Carlo simulation, he could put all those initial conditions at the point, exactly at the point of intersection of the parabola and the diagonal, and they'd all just stay there. Um, but he wouldn't do that. Right? It would be easier. It would be easier, <laughs> right? But if you were seriously doing a Monte Carlo simulation of something that you wanted to actually submit to a journal or something, you wouldn't do that, right? Um, and so he would pick them with, uh, according to some probability distribution, could be uniform along the di diagonal. It doesn't have to be. The um, result he's going to get isn't going to be too sensitive to that choice of probability distribution as long as it has a density that doesn't vary too quickly along the diagonal. Yeah. So, and what would the justification of that is that whatever kind of process we think being thrown around by your can of the baggage handlers and being, you know, bounced uh, uh, by, by waves on the Adriatic on a ferry, we don't think they target points like, you know, yeah, yeah. They don't, we don't think they make much of a difference between nearby points on, on the diagonal. Okay. Happy idea. And really, I, I don't have to get more precise than that in order for this sort of thing to work. As long as everyone shares that judgment, yeah, we're all going to say, yeah, it's more likely to end up in A than B. Got the idea? Okay. Okay. And in some cases, you can make very um, good predictions. About a thousand gadgets have been running for a while. A wide range of measures over initial conditions will vary with very high probability that the actual frequencies are, are, close to, of, 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 are, are close to the ratio of measures on that very uh, measure. Yeah, yeah. And I actually think that um, cases where we can make precise predictions, um, something like this always comes in, in, into place. So you might think, in the 80s, um, there is a lot of popular literature about chaos theory, and they're saying chaotic motion makes prediction impossible. But in this case, it is the fact that it's chaotic that's making this kind of prediction possible. Because you don't know, have to know very much about the initial conditions in order to say, okay, that's close to the probability. You know, those frequencies are going to be close to that. Okay. Okay. So here's the picture I have. You know, um, you start with certain things. The ingredients that go in the recipe of making the, the, these kind of probabilities I'm talking about. So you've got some physical system. And for some time, T day, there's some kind of limitation of knowledge about it, a limitation of control over it. You can get it. Um, and you've got a, actually, instead of initial say, say state of time T0, because I don't want to carry any, this is carrying any um, implications that somehow this is the beginning of all time or something like that. So you've got some judgments about uh, um, which credences um, about states of time t0 are reasonable given this knowledge. And the only condition is that those credences should not be too fine-grained. I think a reasonable thing is if um, our access to this position is via certain instruments that have a certain resolution, and then our credences the credence of any reasonable agent should vary too quickly to to put the over the resolution of that uh, instrument. Okay. And dynamical is taking the initial state and the later state. And there are certain things that you're going to measure about the about about the um, later state. So in this case, I were saying, yeah, um, is it the, the ball in this diagonal in this interval or is it in that interval? Right. So if you 
recap on that. And I said earlier that these, um, the, the, um, there's a certain convergence of probabilities towards the attractor distribution. Um, and it, it doesn't start out exactly the, 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 the attractor distribution. It'll never become exactly the attractor distribution. But you know, give me any tolerance, and actually it'll be below that tolerance. But in, in, one in passing. When I talk about this sort of convergence of probability distribution, Sometimes people are reminded of things that happen on repeated updating that can take different priors into very similar posterior posteriors. This is totally different because we're not updating on anything. We're not giving new information. We're just taking a probability distribution and evolving. Okay. All right, so we can always evolve these. Use it if you have the dynamics. You can develop. Evolve the probability distribution. And, okay. So here's my definition. Say, if you have all these, and if for some number e, p, every credence function in this um, in it set of reasonable credence functions get mapped to, to something that gives within epsilon the same probability for p. I, I've been using the word epistemic chance uh, for this. I don't, I'm not very really enamored of it, but that's what I've been using. So that's the definition. Now, something interesting about this is that it doesn't fit into this um, dichotomy that we started of, of notions of probability of epistemic or you know, previous chance, because it's got some epistemic Notions in it. The idea of credence of reasonable agents and stuff like that. This also, you can't define it without the physical dynamics in it, and I do mean the actual dynamics of the system. Now, sometimes people say to me when I, they hear about this, well, you take a credence and you evolve it by the dynamics of the system, you get a credence. This is just credence. And it's important for my account that it not be. So Bob, yeah, this is well defined whether anybody knows the actual dynamics of the system and then can do the calculations. So Bob actually, so you might act, you might mistakenly believe that a coin is a fair coin. But it might be the case that if I take your credences about the state of the coin at the at, at um, the the initial at the, at the right after the flip. It might be that those evolved into something that gives a higher probability to heads and tails. So the, the epistemic chance in this case might be very close to one half, and your credence might be very different. Uh, sorry, might, the epistemic chance might be two thirds, and your credence might be one half. Yeah, Barry? The, the idea is that the dynamics objectifies the, the credence, right? And so it takes. A big, any one of a big white swath of credences and evolves them into the same, same place. Um, yeah, so the idea is here, I want to say it washes out differences between, between things. Right. Is that what so, you mean by objectifying? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I thought that would be a good way to think about it. But it does seem just a, a question. It seems to depend very much on the dynamics. The yes. Dynamics, and on what, what you're taking, what, what you're looking at. The, the credence distribution at the end, what the, um, in your case, I, I forget what it was, whether it's an A or um, right. the A or the B. Yes. And so, so for a given dynamics, you might find that there are some um, end states that you might be interested in for which it doesn't work at all, even if it works for others. It will inevitably be the case. Yeah. That's so. great. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so this is, this is important. Um, as I mentioned before, the, um, the full state space of the Prow gadget has another variable, um, which, so the, the, the evolution of the um, ball on the diagonal is, isn't invertible because um, the, the, the um, same thing on the, the diagonal can be reached by 
the kernel points can be, can be reached by two different points, so it's not invertible. But that's not the feature that's making this kind of thing work. And actually, the full state space of the dynamics includes another variable that goes back and forth and keeps track of where the thing was, whether it's still left or right on, on the previous iteration. And so the, 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 in, the, in the book, I write down the um, dynamics for the full state space. Um, and it is invertible. And that means that. If I start with the ball on the left side of the dynamics, so there'll be a set of states which starts with the ball on the left side, and there'll be a set of states on uh, 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 the ball on the right side. Those are the joint, this joint set of states. And if you look at the full state space of the, uh, of the, of the parabola gadget, those remain disjoint. <coughs> so there will all, always be some question I can ask about the system for which I don't get that kind of convergence. Right? Um, so that's absolutely true. Now, what happens, of course, is that those two initial states you know, turn into states that are very finely <coughs> intertwined. And if you're, only, if you're looking at the coarse grain level, you're not going to be, this, to be able to distinguish them. So yes, I, so every cause of this is there for a reason. Um, it depends on all of these things. It depends on the dynamics. It depends on um, what this, this, this A is, right? What, what you're assigning things. It's not true that you're going, to, this is going to be true for absolutely every subset set of the state space. Yeah. So I'm thinking um, if we consider the Boltzmann's H theorem, this a situation that is quite analogous to just not with almost any. Um, density function right. on mu space, and you typically end up with a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Yeah. Still, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution has nothing to do with credences or chances. It's an objective distribution of velocities and particles in, inside the gas. And we want to understand why we find this, phys why we find this physical reality. Okay. Yeah. Right, OK. Good, 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 good. Uh, Here's what this will give you. And you tell me whether um, this, this, this counts as an explanation or not. Um, think of the par parabola gadget. I can say to, to Bob that unless you think you have an incredibly fine grade knowledge of the initial state, for this case of a thousand things, you should expect the frequencies to be roughly eight fifths. Okay. That's the argument. This is what you should expect. I can run a parallel argument with the with 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 um, the gas. You should expect the gas to approach with a, a Maxwell Bol Boltzmann distribution and, and remain very close to it very much. I think there is a sense of explanation in which like if someone might be puzzled, they think this isn't what I expected to happen. Why is this happening? And you say, no, given stuff you already believe, this is what you should have expected. And so yeah, you explain it. So that that is a sense of explanation that you can get out of this. There, if that sense of explanation that I think has the sort of metaphysical oomph that some people in this room would want. The H theorem also describes an actual evolution of an empirical. Distribution, right. not just of credences. Right. And okay, even though I was using a hypothetical example, I, I want you to imagine an actual system. You know, there are credences about an actual system. Right. So yeah, I've been talking about that. Yeah, so suppose I was talking about an actual system all the time. Yeah. So yeah. And no, well, I mean it's different time evolution of an actual empirical distribution of a credence function, so that. Yeah. Um, well, so it's not an actual evolution of the credence function, because it, 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 what it is is you're taking a credence function and it's evolving, but your, your, your credences aren't tra tracking that. Just, what you end up is not, we, we're not, this is not change over time of, of Bob's credences. Yeah, right. So. Um, yeah, so what's, yeah, yeah so I, I feel like yeah, um, there's something behind what you're saying that, that, that's worrying me not quite here. So 
What I can do with this kind of notion is say to somebody, look, unless you think you've got absurdly detailed knowledge of the initial, of the initial state of the gas, of this physical, you make, does it help if I say, of this physical system, right? This physical system of gas, which is a, a physical system that has nothing to do with Newton's behavior, is, it, 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 it has, has nothing to do with your state of mind. You should expect it to evolve toward this actual physical system. You should expect this, um, this system to evolve towards an Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. There is, a, I claim, a sense of explanation in which you actually have given him an explanation. And if you say, well, no, you, the, um, so that, that's, 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 that's what, that's what I'm, 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 I'm claiming. However, let me say that. Um, this is another question of um, difference of approach. Um, when I, when I mentioned the um, uh, um, questions that were motivating me, what was puzzling me was this idea that there seemed to be a use of an epistemic um, notion of probability that can be really testable predi predictions, and I wanted to make sense of that. I, I, right, I didn't say anything about the explanation, and honestly, I, th I take the idea of explanation to be fairly obscure, and I tend to shy away from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think I understand. Well, let me try to yeah. yeah. what's behind yeah. Justin's question. On the slide, you have the word epistemic, you have the word credence. Right. All of these notions seem to be playing a very central role right. yeah. in something that's being defined. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. If someone says, uh, gee, I don't understand how lung cancer occurs. And someone says, here, I'll, I'll, let me tell you about these uh, pathways about radiation comes in and it causes this kind of mutation and that and that and it's developed this way. Mm -hmm. None of that has to do with any obvious way with beliefs or credences right. or anything. It has to do with radiation and right. mutations and things like that. That we think now it may be at the end of that explanation, someone says, oh, so if, if I bombard you with a lot of radiation, I ought to expect uh, uh, or at least have a higher credence that you'll you'll get cancer. Mm -hmm. I might say, yeah, but but don't think that that belief and credence plays any role in the explanatory thing I just gave you, right? It's a consequence. Um, it, this, this will interact with your creole states in a certain way, but it's not defined. But what I did right. wasn't defined in terms of that. That was the sense that I understood when Dustin was saying, look, when Boltzmann proves the H theorem, mm -hmm. there are no creedal notions around. This is true, right? Okay, so, so and, and if, but you, if you kind of try to assimilate it to what you have on the board, then you're going to miss that, because what you have on the board, there are lots of creedal states around. Okay, right, yeah, so, certainly, yeah, so, certainly. And, and by the way, you just hit 100% off your prediction. <laughs> 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 Um, so what I want to say is yes to all of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, um, Tim yesterday was talking about the notion of typicality, and, and um, he was saying, "Well, should this guide my expectations?" And he said, "I don't have a story about that." Yeah. So here's a story about how certain physical considerations should Fine. guide your expectations. Fine. Fine. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So what, what okay. question were letting you? When, when the H theorem is proven and there is this assumption that there are no correlations between the particles, isn't that something that may be considered credence like? What are these correlations we're talking about? No, that's, that's just to say that in overwhelmingly most po possible points in phase space that, the, that describe the gas, there are no such correlations, or they're very near zero. That's just statistical. The set of the set of 
of initial states. Remember, you've got a you know an Avogadro number of, yeah. of particles. So these correlations are statistically well defined over you know the, the statistical facts. And for overwhelmingly most of those states, those correlations are in fact right. almost zero. You see, and then I want to know is okay, it's so I accept that. Should I expect this gas to equilibrate? Right. And I think the answer is yes, and we need an account of why you should expect it to equilibrate. What do you mean in the overwhelming number of states there are no equation? If you know the exact microstate, you can't even define what it means for like one particle to be correlated with another. But, but because it's not about one particle being correlated with another part. It's about it's about correlations between sets of particles. It's not an issue. Who cares whether I don't? You're right. I, if, if I have a if I have a, a gas and I pick out particle A and particle B and I say are particle A and B correlated, I'm going to say well, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. But if I ask, are the positions right? Here's a subset. I mean, when you do the actual calculation the way Boltzmann did, okay. you take a subset. Think of them as a target particle. Mm -hmm. Right? They're all at mutual rest within epsilon. Here's another subset. Think of it as the attacking particles. They're all coming in, mm -hmm. approaching these with some momentum velocity within epsilon. Right. Okay. And then you can perfectly well ask whether the positions of these are correlated with the positions of these. It's about frequency. And it's, it's important that they're big okay. groups. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're big enough right. groups that you have, you know, well-defined frequencies. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So if you look at what Boltzmann does, that's exactly what he does. He partition. Yeah. You know, he looks at things that are about to collide from with each other, and he partitions the the momentum range in, into these chunks, which are small on some me measure, but big enough that the number of, of, of molecules in, in each partition right. is going to be big as a big gas. And he assumes that the um, you know rough you know do a good approximation the the, the frequency of the, of of, um, of things that have instances of this momentum and this that this momentum is just the product right. of, of those frequencies. And let me just mention in the philosophical literature, which is kind of a mare's nest on all this stuff, a lot of people will say ridiculous things when they're trying to track down the source of the, of the temporal asymmetry of, say, the H theory. And they'll say, oh, that's because if I have a pair of particles and they start out uncorrelated and they interact, that after they've interacted, they're correlated. And you say, what the hell does that mean? I mean it just doesn't mean anything, right? It's crazy. How, how, however, one thing, okay, here, here's something that may, does make sense. So. I just said if you look at all the uh, pairs of particles that are about to collapse and 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 count and and and, and, and do this do, do this count, you, uh, um, you're 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 you to get back to the right, right? Now you could also, and both one isn't is not interested in this. You could also look at the um, pairs of particles that have just bounced off each other, and you would, unless it was already equilibrium, you wouldn't assume the, course, the, 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 um, the corresponding factorization of frequencies for those. But that does not play any role right. in, in it. Right. Sorry, so there is a temporal but, asymmetry. But it, no, it's not a temporal asymmetry. You, you, you've read the game by saying the ones that have just bounced off each other. You right. can do it in the forward direction and say, just look at the ones that are about to bounce off each other. Right. Right? right. And then you'll get exactly the same result. So, and those are, but, those are the ones we're interested in, because we're, we're, we're looking at... So, I mean, so put it this way. You might ask, well, okay, I've got a gas that's equilibrating, that's, it's not, it's out of equilibrium, but it's approaching the maximum of the Boltzmann distribution, right? Um, and that's because you're assuming, it, and, and that follows from the stokes on on, 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 on on sides. Reverse all the velocities that have got a different state of the gas. A gas that will lead away, a state that will lead away from the equilibrium. The Stokes you know, file on sides will not hold for, unless you're already in equilibrium, the Stokes file on sides will not hold for the state of the gas you get by reversing all the velocities. If you came from a low entropy state, right? If you're right. at a turnaround point, you have a fluctuation. That's right. You're okay, that's right. If, okay I, 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 I said it wrong. Unless, yeah, I, I, 
Unless you're either the corporate or at the turnaround point. Yeah, but also, like, you know, my worry was in all these physical arguments, it's important that this f function describes the actual density of particles that are about to collapse, not just credence and so on. Particles, credence is going to collide. Yes, so, like I said, yeah, so what's absolutely important in all of this is, um, sorry, the other thing. Absolutely essential is everything that I mentioned. And the dynamics of the actual system is a crucial ingredient. Yes. What is F? Absolutely. Right. So this is not a go oh, right. So what happens is, you know, so I, the objections I get is uh, is this is okay, this isn't purely objective chance, and that the answer is yes. Uh, someone tells tells me, well, okay, this is all about credences, and the answer is no, it's not all about credences. Something is playing a very crucial role is the actual dynamics of the system. If the damn things weren't colliding, I wouldn't have the What's that? In the Boston equation, the probability distribution figures in the description, in the dynamical description of the relation. You're talking about the description of the factual frequencies. Yeah, but that's just the Boston side. Yeah, that's, but that, no, the, the, the description of actual frequencies is not a probability distribution. It's a, it's a fact about the state of the gas at the time. No, it's just a coarse graining of the. It's, it's just yeah, a yeah, coarse graining, graining of the actual state. Yeah. It's just a coarse graining of the distribution. That has yeah. nothing to do with anybody's knowledge. Yeah, right, and it's not a probability distribution. Right. You said the probability is not. Well, te yeah, technically, it is. Yeah, it's you know, based on frequency. Yeah, it's true. It is uh, okay, we, we did this already. We did that already. <laughs> There's lots of things that that have been called around with off accents that are not probability distributions. Yeah, so so you're saying these things as if they're in a tone of voice, as if they're an objection, and my answer to all of them is yes. Yes. Right. Okay, well, but, but here's the thing. Okay, so what counts for the behavior of the gas is the Frequency distributions of molecules that collide. Yes, that's true. And so, actually, these post main densities actually evolve by the Boltzmann iteration to the next Boltzmann. What I claim is, well, they they do for some states of the gas. Yeah. And it's right, right. Wait, wait, wait. They do for some states of the gas, and they don't for others. Now, if you ask me what I should expect the um, uh, um, uh, 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 okay, here's, here's the connection. Yeah. It is the state of the gas that determines what the gas is going to do. Let me say that a hundred times in case people don't think. No, no, no. It's built in there. It, 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 it is explicit there. It is the state of the system and the dynamic velocity that determine what the system is going to do. Just pretend I said that a hundred times. Okay. So, some states of the gas will evolve towards a maxwell boltzmann distribution that some states won't. If you will ask me what I should I expect the gas to do, my claim is that unless you are uh, pretending to absurdly precise knowledge of the state of the gas, knowledge that you could not possibly have, your credence should be concentrated on states of the gas for which this filter a la onsets is approximately true. And so you should expect the actual evolution of the actual the actual state of the gas and its actual evolution by the actual dynamics to be one that leads to towards a magnetic bolts on distribution. In my various synonyms, I apologize if I misunderstood yeah. your point that this argument would involve an evolution of credence functions by the Boltzmann equation, which kind of strikes me as a category mistake of sorts. Credence functions. So when did I, okay, we're, the Boltzmann equation is not a of the, of the, uh, uh, of the full, of the full stage. It's an evolution of these, of, of these, the cost range. Of, of, of these, of, of these, of these fre fre frequencies. Um, okay. So what? 
about the, uh, the, uh, the um, okay. Should I uh, expect? So I write down the Boltzmann equation, okay. and it, it, it assumes that these frequencies factorize. Um, it is impossible for that to hold exactly forever, but um, we do expect that for the sorts of states of gases that we can prepare, it will uh, uh, the hold with high degree approximation for a long time. <coughs> That's all I'm saying. You should expect that. 